11 p.m. at the La Pena Cultural Center, 3105 Shattuck Avenue in Berkeley. Suggested donation $10. For more information, call 510-658-9178. The Jyoti Kala Mandar Performance Company will present an Odyssey Indian classical dance performance on Sunday, April 3rd and 10th at the Cubberley Theatre, 4000 Middlefield Road in Palo Alto, at 5 p.m. Call 510-486-9851 for more information. Learn more about Women First and its volunteer positions at a volunteer open house on Wednesday, April 6th from noon to 2 p.m at 7200 Bancroft Avenue, Suite No. 260, in Oakland. To RSVP, contact Yasmin at 510-729-6236. The Community Calendar is produced by members of the KPFA Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA, Box 511929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way, Berkeley, California 94704 or fax them to 510-848-3812. Attention to the community calendar. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767 extension 621. The community calendar is also available online at www.kpfa.org. Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. And welcome to the show tonight. My name is G. It's a wonderful spring night, and it's getting there. Daylight savings time, and this week we've got a whole lot of things up for you. We're going to be hearing about the tsunami that just happened. Oh, excuse me, the quake. We're not talking about the quake, another tragedy off the coast of Indonesia. We're going to be hearing about that, as well as some w- really, really wonderful other things. Curtis here is with me here tonight. He has been working so hard. So, Curtis, what's up? So we're also going to be talking with local artist Indigo Sam as she took a look at Chinese restaurants in the Deep South in a big art, uh, photography project that she had. Also, we're going to have a chance to talk with Noi Noi Silva from Hawaii about her discoveries of Native Hawaiian's early desire uh, for independence from U.S. interests. And uh, it's now 7.03, and we do want to start the show off in a nice, fresh way. We've got uh, Jeff Chang. He is the author of the latest book, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A History of the Hip-Hop Generation. And he talks about, in this little short interview, the small portion of this music that's served up by corporations and how Asian and Pacific Islanders fit into this mix, including Chinese-American MC Jin. So let's take a listen. These days, like I tell this, I tell folks this all the time, the hip hop that you get, you know, through the global media monopolies, um, is a very small sliver of what hip hop is actually about and how hip hop is lived at the local levels. You know what I mean? Hardcore stuff to progressive stuff from, you know, African American to Latino to Asian to Native American, and a very small sliver of that spectrum is getting funded, capitalized to go through the global media monopolies. For Asian American artists within that, um, a lot of times they are perceived as underground, as local artists or that type of thing. Mm-hmm. In, the, in America, the thing is about trying to find five artists that are just going to be cows that you can milk. You're looking for the back catalog. You're looking for your Elvis or your Beatles or your Eminem. You know what I mean? So it's the kind of thing where it's not like the UK where things turn around, where there's openings all the time for folks like MIA to kind of come out and Asian Dub Foundation before her and uh, Fundamental and all these other types of artists to come in and make some noise and, you know, shake up the whole pop mm-hmm. scene. It's much more closed here in America. In your book, uh, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, if you were to write about the Asian American music scene and, and hip hop, how would you see Asian Pacific Islanders fit into this whole social history of, of the hip hop generation? Because there are folks that 
you know, now they have their niche. I mean, if you go to Hawaii, mm -hmm. you know, you'll hear it. Um, people are using that and, and mixing it with traditional music. Mm -hmm. You know, you definitely hear it with, um, in particular, the South Asian Underground and like Lyrics Born and Dan Nakamura. Yeah. There's a lot of people who are trying to infuse their own language and their own heritage into it, too. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's like a future chapter in your book? If I were to write something about, you know, Asian Pacific Islanders, I would look at it as this opening of hip hop to allowing other voices to be able to express themselves in a very, very powerful kind of way. I mean, talk about Scribe in New Zealand, you know, who's the number one uh, artist in New Zealand and makes just some incredible hip hop. You know, I mean, there's a lot of similarities when you listen to Scribe uh, and you listen to Jin, just the way that they, their cadences, the way that they present the music. You know, and Scribe is, again, he's the number one artist out there. He's ethnic Samoan and he's, you know, in New Zealand. There's examples like that all around, you know, the globe. Um, uh, diasporic, you know, kinds of influence. There's a lot of folks coming from here, going to the Philippines and, mm -hmm. and making it. There's a lot of those types of things that, that need to be written about and it's part of the spread of hip hop. Well, there's a lot of Filipinos. DJs and producers now. I mean, oh, absolutely. Came out of the turntable thing. Here in the Bay Area. Yeah, right, absolutely. Definitely. And yeah. they are really something like Hubert and all those mm -hmm. folks that came out from Daily City, mm -hmm. um, Hercules, etc. Who Fremont. actually, yeah, who yeah. actually produced uh -huh. a lot. Dan, Dan yeah. is, is not Filipino; he's Japanese American, but uh -huh. he came out of that scene and is now extremely well known producer. And, yeah, right. and yeah. I guess my question is, they don't say they don't have to get out there personality-wise. You kind of notice this sort of behind the scenes. I mean, yeah. there's still like this sort of a reflection of if you guys trying to find our voices still this whole question of identity if you're a DJ or a producer you don't necessarily put yourself out front it's part of the persona of a DJ you're behind the boards you're behind the decks you're enabling an MC to rhyme you're enabling a crowd to get down and stuff like that the thing that the turntablists did that the the you know, Filipino Bay Area turntablists did was they put DJing in the forefront of and skill of you know cutting scratching and mixing a record but even there they were never about wearing the Filipino flag on their on their jackets and stuff like that, you know. They were proud and they were representing that, but it wasn't necessarily something that they were looking to put forth. And so yeah, I mean we're still maybe in an evolutionary stage of trying to get to a point where where we can be loud and proud, you know. I mean Jin is out there, uh he's taking a lot of heat. You know, I'm just glad that he's he's continuing to keep his head up and moving on. He's working on his new album now. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, light years ahead of where the last record was. And the last record was pretty good. There were songs like Sing Cry on there um, that were talking about things from an Asian Pacific Islander perspective, you know. So he's repping that and he knows that he's out there and he's going to be doing that and stuff like that. So, yeah, maybe we're just in that evolutionary stage of getting to that point where there is an acceptance and we're going to have to fight for it. But, you know, it's... It, you know, it'll be ours if, yeah. if we if we struggle I think, for uh, it. Once it comes out, there's going to be more shows like Apex who are looking for stuff like that. Yeah, and gladly play absolutely. It. Yeah. Um, sort of to wind this up, uh, Can't Stop, Won't Stop is put up by St. Martin's Press. That's right. All the website stuff, I mean, all the stuff is on the website. Um, I'm doing appearances in a bunch of different places kind of coming up. Um, and so you can definitely check that on the website. There's a lot of information you can contact through the website as well. And it's www.cantstopwontstop.com. Okay, once again, www.cantstopwontstop.com. Uh, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, a history of the hip-hop generation. Go to that website. And I'd like to thank Jeff Chang, the author, for coming on Apex Express. Thank you. And that was Jeff Chang and G with Flutter by Bonobo underneath them. In, 19, in 1778, British explorer Captain Cook landed in Waimea on the island of Kauai, which is in what is now the state of Hawaii. In a song entitled Hawaii 78, Israel Kamakawiwoole, a famous Hawaiian musician, somberly sings about how he feels the ancient kings and queens would respond to the modern state of Hawaii. Afterwards, Apex's Lawton Chan meets with Noe Noe Silva, an associate professor at the University of Hawaii, who used her native Hawaiian language to research historical documents written by Hawaiians to shed light on the Hawaiian resistance to annexation.
to Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM. My name is Lawton and I'm here speaking with Noe Noe Silva, Associate Professor of Political Science and Hawaiian Language at the University of Hawaii. Her book, Aloha Betrayed, Native Hawaiian Resistance to American Colonialism, was published in August of 2004 by Duke University Press. Can you give the listeners an introduction to your book? Um, what prompted you to do uh, research into Hawaiian history and um, how were you able to find the um, Hawaiian language uh, sources? I started out as a student of Hawaiian language. My bachelor's degree is in Hawaiian language. And as I became fluent in the language, I also became aware, was made aware, that everybody who becomes fluent in Hawaiian has a responsibility to teach the language because Hawaiian is an endangered language. And because I wanted to teach at the college level, then I had to go and get 
advanced degrees. So I started to work on advanced degrees. I went to library school and got a degree in library and information studies. And then I went um, into political science. And when I got into political science, then I started learning some critical theory, um, some post-colonial theory, which got me thinking about Hawaiian history. And so I started looking into and reading Hawaiian history as it was written in English. And then I realized that what I was, what I knew already from Hawaiian language newspapers did not, was not reflected in mainstream Hawaiian history writing. So, and furthermore, once I started critically reading Hawaiian history, um, Hawaiians are pretty absent in the history as written because historians uh, have not read what was written in Hawaiian by Hawaiians. Uh, one of the myths that's created out of that lack of uh, reading of Hawaiian sources is that Hawaiians did not resist um, any of the colonialism, um, any of the land dispossession or loss of the language, loss of the nation. The Hawaiians didn't make any effective resistance to any of that. That's a myth that's created by the absence of uh, Hawaiians in narratives of Hawaiian history. So I could see that, and so that's where I started my research for my dissertation. The book comes out of my dissertation. It's not the same as my dissertation, but it's based on my dissertation. Uh, can you give a quick introduction um, into the how the annexation of Hawaii happened? And um, how does this book present a, a different history from the version we might be more familiar with from uh, more mainstream sources? Well, first of all, I think that most um, you know people in California, except for the Hawaiians, probably have no idea how Hawaii got to be part of the United States. The way the his mainstream historians generally tell the story is that the monarchy, uh, starting with Kalakaua and then um, the last queen, Lili'uokalani, were basically incompetent and dangerous to American interests. And so um, some Hawaiian subjects with American parents or grandparents together with Americans and with the uh, U.S. military and the help of the U.S. minister forced Queen Lili Oakland to step down and then they set up a provisional government and then they struggled with the United States for five years and finally persuaded the United States to annex Hawaii. And then we go on from there and then Hawaii is a territory meaning a colony, political colony of the United States until 1959 when there was a statehood vote. So the whole story as it's told in uh, mainstream histories um, is about those people. It's about the descendants of Americans and the Americans and their struggle with America, with the U.S., I mean, over persuading the U.S. to take Hawaii. So there's very few Hawaiian characters in that story. And they, they do mention, uh, you know, from time to time a little bit, oh, okay, we got this document of people protesting or the queen protested and the queen was put on trial. That's all um, said more or less, usually less. <laughs> the difference in my book is that I go and read the newspaper accounts letters and other documents that Hawaiians wrote themselves during that period. So they have numerous um, diplomatic protest documents sent to the United States and elsewhere. Um, the Queen also wrote many protest documents that are on file in the United States and elsewhere. And uh, I know then, of course, this massive petition in 1897. So, and, and um, but reading about how they did that in Hawaiian and reading their correspondence and so forth. So, the the narrative in my book 
of the annexation is is very different because it's all almost exclusively um, a report on what the Hawaiians um, said and did at the time. And what is the status of the Hawaiian sovereignty movement today? I know there's some, been some talk about perhaps having some kind of like reservation status like Native Americans. Uh, what makes most sense for Hawaiians, and what are the pros and cons of that? Well, right now there is a bill in Congress. Um, it's uh, called the Akaka Bill, or the Native Hawaiian Government Reorganization Bill. And this bill purports to give, um, to not to give, but to begin a process to give federal recognition to a Native Hawaiian governing entity. So uh, that's going on. And the recent um, vote to open up drilling in the Alaska um, Wildlife um, Refuge uh, that Alaska National National Wildlife Refuge, um, that is linked into this bill. So our senators who are pushing this bill voted for opening up the drilling in that um, amour. There are other groups who um, believe that Hawaiian sovereignty means that Hawaii should be independent, and they are pursuing... Um, a couple of different avenues. Prior to the statehood vote, Hawaii was on the United Nations list of non-self-governing territories. And that process, um, the statehood vote took, got Hawaii taken off of that list, but many people are contesting that and saying that the process was not correct because they didn't follow the decolonization process properly. They didn't offer people any other alternative. It was statehood or, or nothing. So people are, are trying, have been trying for a long time to get Hawaii reinscribed on the list of non-self-governing territories at the UN. And then another whole stream um, that is saying that because the overthrow uh, was then um, illegally and actually constitutes a military occupation of the Kingdom of Hawaii by the United States. This is a very detailed um, legal argument, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a very well-crafted um, argument that doesn't have many holes in it, um, that Hawaii is actually still retains its sovereignty and can be analyzed as being under military occupation, and so therefore the international laws of occupation apply. And, um, of course, the U.S. is then seen to be in violation of all of those laws, um, but that there could be an argument made at the international level that, you know, the, Hawaii, the, the Kingdom of Hawaii could actually reconstitute it and um, that the U.S. should simply withdraw its military from here and allow um, the the kingdom of Hawaii to um, to take over the government. So that is a very lively um, a movement at the moment. There's lots of people that are in that. There's lots of people that are persuaded by that argument. So as usual, we are an island, diverse people. And we have diverse opinions on what constitutes sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for coming on the show with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Lawton. For the consciousness of the nation, the sounds of the Asian the foundation. Someone else's orders, plenty of issues on the agenda. If you want to lend a help.
And you've been listening to the Asian Dub Foundation. They are out of the UK, one of the best, best Asian underground, now come overground folks around. We have some music in the background, Indonesian sort of music with some beats. And we're going to be talking a little bit about what's uh, going to happen, what's coming up in Indonesia, but that's coming up a little bit later. What we want to go to next on Apex Express right here on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno is an interview by a very special artist, Indigo Sam, and she's going to be talking about food and the South and Asian Americans. you got to hear this. So in a bit, we're going to be listening to that uh, right here on KPFA. The time is now 7.31. If you want to get a hold of Apex Express, please do so by contacting us at this number, 510-848-6767, extension 464. That's 510-848-6767, extension 464. Or you can also hear us at www.kpfa.org. And last but not least, our Apex uh, email apex at kpfa.org. My name is G, and coming up next is a talk with that artist by Curtis Liu. So let's take a listen. Listening to KPFA 94.1 in Berkeley, and this is Curtis Liu for Apex Express here with Indigo Sam, a photographer artist in the Bay Area that just finished up an exhibit called Mostly Mississippi, Chinese Restaurants of the South that was showing at the Chinese Historical Society of America. Welcome, Indy. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your project, Mostly Mississippi. Well, this was the latest installment of um, a longer-term project that I'm doing about Chinese restaurants all over the country. So... Um, I had gone on two previous trips, one to Wyoming and the other one um, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And so I'm kind of hitting these sort of representative regions of the country. So the South was next on my list. What regions were you trying to represent? Um, The original idea for this project came from the concept of Chinese restaurants in the middle of nowhere. And... um, I mean, that was how I was thinking of it in my head, but the middle of nowhere is a really problematic characterization of a place. And so um, what I ended up deciding that I meant by that is um, basically anywhere that has a really low Asian American population and really low Chinese American population, anywhere that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see a Chinese restaurant which, um, after I looked at census data from 2000, turned out to be almost the whole country. <laughs> but but I still went for, um, I mean, Wyoming hardly has any people in it, let alone Chinese people. But of the people that are, that are in Wyoming, um, one out of every thousand is Chinese American. So that's where I started. <laughs> so what did you find when you got to these restaurants? Or what was the process like? Um, well, I think for me, one of the major learning things in this whole project has been photography because uh, I, my background is more in sculpture and installation and I was actually kind of camera phobic before this, but um, because I'm a concept driven artist, um, I, I basically do whatever medium is most appropriate to the project and I didn't get too far into this project before I realized that the image is the most important thing and and I really needed to pick up a camera. So, um so it's been a real learning curve and I feel like I I finally know what I'm doing somewhat um on this trip and and that was based on looking at what I had done on previous trips and also looking at other photographers Um, especially um, there were some photographers from the 
late 70s, um, Stephen Shore, William Eggleston, um, people who during that period of time drove around the country um, photographing these large format color pictures of just kind of Americana, just everyday American life. And I was really inspired by looking at some of these some of these works um there's something about the the coexistence of the beautiful and the banal that um that i think is really kind of a uniquely american aesthetic um and without even having seen these photographers on the previous trips that's kind of what i was trying to aim at so I understand that you have audio feeds as well when you were when you're traveling to these places. Um, yeah, that's also a new medium for me. Um, basically, on my first two trips, I I wasn't doing that, and and then I came home and realized what I had missed because some of the sounds are just really great. So um, since I did have adequate funding for for the southern project i um outfitted myself with the mini disc and you know mics and stuff and um and also my partner donna keiko ozawa came with me and she shot video so we were very geared out for this trip and um i i was more interested in a kind of experimental approach to the sound um even though I conducted interviews, we conducted interviews where Donna was videotaping and I was um, recording sound, I, I wanted to work with the material um, more, but I wanted to process it more, abstract it more, um, make it less narrative, less about, less, less in the documentary style. So I chopped up a lot of stuff. <laughs> So you have a piece that we're going to play for our listeners. Do you care to set it up? Um, this was um, based on an interview, or the sound is from an interview that we did with Taft Wong, who is the son of restaurant owners in Greenville, Mississippi. And he's 20 years old. And um, I think partly because of his age, we got a very different interview from him than we did from a lot of the restaurant owners we've been talking to. I think he might actually have been the only interview we did with like a, a son of, or a daughter of, of restaurant owners. Most of the time we we're either talking to restaurant owners or waiters or customers who had no relation to the restaurants. So anyway, um, we were just kind of hanging out with him and it was much more casual and um, we were just having a conversation and just recording it. So um, I think because of that casualness, his personality really came through a lot more. And, and when I came home and listened to what I had, I, I became very fascinated with, with his voice and his personality and um, just some of the things that he said very casually. So that's what I was working with. Well, let's give it a listen. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just I don't know. I don't Maybe. know. I'm too late. But I don't remember their names. So mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. makes sense. <laughs> well, I have the worst memory in the world. She's been working there for a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How long. I don't know. You know what I mean? Uh, well, mm -hmm. that's what I meant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's exactly what I meant to say. Yeah, but I, I can't think. Of. I can't remember I what know. the places are called. I don't know how to explain. It. Talk about the restaurants themselves. How are they different from restaurants here? Well, you know, when I was growing up, I my parents kind of taught me that there are Chinese restaurants for us, Chinese people, and then there's Chinese restaurants for everybody else. And um, I have really developed a great fascination in the Chinese restaurants that are for everybody else um, because that's that's what you have, you know, in the most of the rest of the country, in, especially in these places where the Chinese population is almost negligible. Um, at, you know, as a business, the restaurant owners have to have to cook for 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 their customers' palate and. Um, there are all these different layers of representation and expectation and 
um, sort of self-perpetuating stereotypes that come into play that are pretty interesting, I think. So how do you feel about these, these stereotypes coming through in these communities where there's not a large Asian community and there's not a lot of uh, exposure to you know, the broad Asian experience that we have here in the Bay Area? Well, I think that, um, of course, there's, there's um, my initial emotional kind of reaction to these places is, is always what I'm going on when I'm deciding what to shoot, how to shoot. And, and I, um, I'm one of these people who, for me, like, happiness is a sad song. I mean, I, I like kind of depressing things and um or i'm drawn to them and and so sometimes you know i would just see a restaurant and just be like oh my god that's so awful i have to shoot it and you know it would have the evil chinky front and you know all this tacky kitschy stuff on it and and you know the the kitsch has an appeal i mean it's like this is funny. I mean, to me, like, I, I definitely have a sense of humor about this stuff. Um, especially some of the images from my previous show, the images from Wyoming and Wisconsin and what have you. Um, some of those just had these really grandiose, overblown signs that were just kind of absurd almost. Um, and and I guess I'm just trying to capture sort of the many faces that that these restaurants show. Um, definitely, I think you know, like I said before, these representation issues are are problematic because um, I think that even though I mean I set out to show that we have this enormous influence over American culture because almost everybody in this country has eaten Chinese food or eaten what they thought was Chinese food. And so, wow, how huge is that? But on the other hand, what they're eating isn't really Chinese and what they're seeing is not really Chinese. And 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 what they see the least is probably the most Chinese part of these restaurants, which is the people who run them. Um, so there is this kind of, there's irony and pathos and all kinds of stuff in there. So if we wanted to find out more about your work or upcoming exhibits, where would we go? My website, um, www.indigosom.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have been listening to artist Indigo Sam. Hey, if you were into food and uh, Chinese food in particular, check it out. Sounds great. Thanks to Curtis for that interview. Uh, my name is G here on Apex Express here on KPFA and KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. We are here tonight again to talk about Indonesia. Uh, another quake has struck, as folks may well know, uh, another fairly major quake uh, in Nias, which is an island off the coast of Sumatra. And uh, last we've heard is about a thousand people have perished and the island itself is, is very devastated. There's been small quakes going on over the last couple of days. And here to talk about the latest in what's happening in Indonesia, um, both the disaster that happened as well as the political implications of it is uh, UC professor Sylvia Tiwan. She is a professor at the Southeast Asian Studies Department at UC Berkeley. I want to thank you once again for coming on the show, Professor. Thank you for having me. You know, uh, a little bit um, uh, update, any update that you might have heard uh, about Nias. Um, we, we talked a little bit before about the, the, the people themselves. Uh, you were saying it's a fairly pluralistic society, a lot of different uh, cultures and religions. Uh, the people who, the native islander people there, their uh, industry is basically uh, fishing and and agriculture and surprisingly there's some surfing there as well. So, you know, you have kind of this interesting sort of almost resort feel where you have subsist at the same time mm -hmm. subsistence um, endeavors going on. But bring us up to date, anything you've heard from friends or contacts uh, on the islands over there? Well, um, what I've heard is that um, like 80% of the most densely populated areas have been destroyed. You know, uh, the, the roads, the buildings, and the, 
electricity is still not on in most of the places. There's no running water, and um, the rescue um, missions are, have been pretty late, actually, considering that it, it, it's not that far from Aceh, and it was hit by that first. Um, Boxing Day, well, the 26th of December quake mm -hmm. and tsunami. It didn't suffer so much from that one, but this one hit closer, and so um, you know it's been really badly hit. Mm -hmm. And um, well, the usual thing, you know, when aid gets their date, then you have um, bodies rotting in the rubble. There was no tsunami this time round, of course, but you do have a lot of just physical damage um, caused by the quake. You know, there's been other um, aftershocks, and, and, and I understand from you, others, other, I guess, tremblers. And I'm wondering, you know, what kind of mood that puts, puts people in, uh, in, uh, in Sumatra in particular, uh, the, and off the coast of Sumatra, which is one of the main islands there. What kind of mood do, are people in? I mean, they must be like hanging on pins and needles because not only is there nature that they have to contend with, but, you know, the government as well and the instability, I think, politically that Indonesia goes through. What, what is that sentiment that, that might be there? Well, it's put, I think, um, most people in most of the islands at, in um, somewhat, as you say, you know, on pins and needles. Um, um, in Indonesia, you would say it's like walking on eggs, you know. Um, you, you don't really know where to step that's going to be safe. You feel, you feel unsafe with the ground underneath your feet threatening to move at any moment. And you feel unsafe. Um, psychologically and socially because everything's um, a lot of people are feeling oh something's coming apart here mm -hmm. um, so that's one side of it but um, when you look at the other side of the coin you know that uh, the, what the tsunami did for Aceh for example it brought about a huge amount of destruction and that is terrible it is um, you know, no amount of talking around it will will really be able to to bring convey the extent of the horror mm -hmm. over there. But at the same time, that tsunami also blew open the cover that the military had imposed upon the whole place. That isolationist policy just blew wide open. They had to. They were forced to accept foreign assistance mm -hmm. because they knew they couldn't do it on right. their own. A little bit of background is just that Aceh had been kind of cordoned off by the Indonesian military uh, because of um, a movement for some sort of more independence from the central government in Aceh and had been off limits to foreigners for a long time. For uh, the last three years, yeah. definitely. You mm -hmm. need a special permit to get it into Aceh. Now, what happened in Aceh with much, a lot of foreign aid coming in and people helping um, that weren't Indonesian, the Indonesian government, up until just before the quake, the recent quake, had said, okay, the date is coming up in April where we are going to have the foreign NGOs, etc., aid people leave Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And then the quake, this quake hits off of Nias. What now will the government do and and I I'm just going to assume and and maybe you can talk about this a little bit more. The Indonesian government wanted uh, foreign aid out of the country because it was making them them look bad. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, the, it, it's hard to um, look at it simplistically. Actually, uh -huh. you have to when you say the Indonesian government, you also have to realize that there are many factions in there and. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the military that does not want to lose their grip on the place, on, on the entire nation. And especially they don't want to lose their grip on Aceh. You know, they had their, really had closed it down. Mm -hmm. It was theirs. It was Ex their Exxon operation. is there, right? Exxon, Mobile is there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of timber. There's a lot of gold. It's very... Uh, resource rich area there's coffee there too some of the best coffee grows there now um the indonesian army didn't want to let go of that they and this comes after east timor you know the 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 trauma that the military indonesian military lived through losing east timor um they didn't want that to happen again in Aceh, and so they really sat on it and and closed it down 
Now, they also, of course, occupy in a way the whole nation, the entire Indonesian archipelago. You know, they, they've divided it, it up into territorial commands. They don't want to let anybody else in. They were really not happy with having uh, foreign armies coming in, um, all these um, foreign NGOs coming in, the U UN organizations coming in. And so the... Uh, what was happening was that one deadline would be announced. Um, the first was March the 26th. Everybody's going to be out of there, all these foreigners. And then, you know, the, some minister has to come out and say, well, it's not really, we're not really ready yet. Mm -hmm. you know, so we could see this internal push and pull right. between the, the military and the civilian. Do you think that the civilian sector of the country and in the government has gotten stronger. Like you said, there was a new, there's a new pres uh, president now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th there was um, a point because of the conflict in East Timor and back in the 60s there was this terrible um, overturning of the government where... A huge massacre. Yeah, a huge massacre place. in the yeah. 60s. Um, and the CIA was a part of that. So now with the world looking at Indonesia again, do you think that the civil part sector of society is getting stronger or is are there openings that where there weren't before yes that's definitely true i mean you have to remember that it's a civil society movement that brought down suhata the longest reigning dictator in southeast asian asia for you know um at that time they took him down um but um, the military, it's hard to get rid of a military and tell them just, you, you belong in barracks, you just stay there. Do not get involved in politics and do not get involved in trying to run the country. Why have they become so strong and, and such a force within the government in different sectors of society? Well, they they came to power, as you said, in 65 uh, in a coup that, you know, was this creeping coup that they staged against um, Sukarno, the Indonesia's first president. And um, so he was brought down in this coup, this military coup, was with the support, of course, from the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they've managed, they managed to keep hold on power for more than 30 years mm -hmm. and when Suharto fell, Suharto was an army general, um, they were reeling. It was uh, the reform movement demanded a reform of the army, mm -hmm. demanded that they get out of politics, demanded that they get out of parliament, demanded that they go back to the barracks mm -hmm. you know, and stop all these military excursions um, and um, operations against their own people. Mm -hmm. You know, now with nature taking its course a very terrible course in, in um, Indonesia and with um, you know actually for a while the United States hadn't had formal relationships with you know I think the government of Indonesia because of criticisms over the military in particular with these two more now uh, you see the US making overtures to the country again to say we want to establish friendly relations and at the same time there's this talk about like how the Islamists are a threat in Indonesia etc and I, I don't know if people know this but I think Indonesia is the, has a population with the largest mu Muslim population in the world so the, you know the US is starting to look at that country again very seriously what do you think about that complex situation? You got the U.S. thrown in here now, and sort of their designs on it are mm -hmm. several, right? It's very complicated indeed. But the thing is that the U.S. has never ended relations with Indonesia. You know, it's always since Suharto, it's always been very warm, very caring and sharing, mm -hmm. and especially caring and sharing in military terms. But in um, the 90s. They were forced to, because uh, by Congress, mm -hmm. to stop their military assistance um, because all this military stuff was being used against the people of East Timor in what was an illegal invasion mm -hmm. of uh, a foreign entity. Mm -hmm. um, but now, because of the um, Islamists, what what's being constructed as an Islamist rising, um, the 
military relations are being reestablished and Condoleezza Rice recently announced that um, you know Indonesia had won recertification you know for being very cooperative uh, with the Americans mm -hmm. and so now they're going to be rejoining the international military um, and education and training program mm -hmm. run by the US right. um, and by the way this certification was reissued that saying that they were being very cooperative because the Indonesian military supposedly has cooperated in the investigation of a case of murder the murder of two American citizens in Papua in Papua in Indonesia and uh, uh, even the police have said that it's the military that killed those two and Americans. And who are they? Um, uh, Mr. Spire, whose wife is a very, um, you know, strong advocate for uh, ending military relations. Uh, Patsy Spire and somebody else, I, I forgot his name. But three people were murdered, two U.S. citizens. This wasn't too long ago, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, but because the you know the the sort of war and terrorism quote unquote has overridden all those concerns. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that you know as um, it, foreign aid I think is going to be in Indonesia for a while, and so you have the world looking at the country where it might have been overlooked before, you know. Now that that's the situation, do you think that's going to spark some change? Coupled with, I think, there is, seems to me, more of a momentum among the non-militarized sector, the civil sector in Indonesia. Do you think that there's going to be more strengthening of that movement for, you know, uh, democracy and civil society? Well, especially for Aceh, I think that has been a closed uh, area for so long. Um, it's been an area of military operations for around three decades. So this is a real opening. It, it's, you know, allowed them to interact with people from outside. It's brought in Indonesians from the other parts of Indonesia into Aceh to, to just help on a people-to-people -people level. And so that is very empowering for the Achenese. It, it also is empowering for the Indonesian civil society. Um, and so you can see how the military is going to try and, um, mm -hmm. you know, say, no, 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 we, do, we want them out. And it, the Minister of Defense, in fact, is using the excuse that because Aceh is such a Muslim area, they don't want all these NGOs there. So many of them are Christians, you know, like mm -hmm. Catholic Relief Services, like the Protestants have their relief services and all that, you know. And the minister in Washington, in fact, he said, well, we're going to get rid of these because they make the Achenese uncomfortable. Now the Achenese turn around and say, excuse me, but we feel very comfortable mm -hmm. having these people around. We respect them for what they're doing. I think if people want to find out more information, there is a website we have in the minute we have left at Apex Express. Uh, it's called Indonesia Alert. I think if you Google that, you're going to get some good information that's come up. And uh, Professor uh, Tiwan has told me about this particular site. So, folks, if you want to learn more about what's going on, I want to thank uh, Sylvia Tiwan, Professor at UC Berkeley, for coming in this last minute to talk about what's going on in Indonesia. Curtis on the board. And stay tuned for Bonnie Simmons. My name is G. Thanks so much for listening. Next week, don't forget Pusod. We doing a collaboration with them API Hip Hop the first week of every month so stay tuned for that
ፈልስፈ ካሬዲዮ አርካይቭስ